and welcome to our Digital Futures Legend Series, where we have the opportunity to discuss with some of the leading architects about their careers and inspirations. I'm Virginia Malnick, and I'm happy to introduce this session with Denise Scott Brown. This session was recorded over several phone calls and images of her work and photos that she's taken have been added. Denise needs very little introduction. Her groundbreaking work as partner at Venturi Scott Brown Architects, where she has designed many buildings and master plans around the world over a long career, and most famously is known for her research and writings on Las Vegas in the seminal book, Learning from Las Vegas, has made her truly a remarkable leader in the field. Although Denise has faced several hardships throughout her career, she has written directly about feminism in architecture in her essay, Room at the Top, Sexism and the SAR System of Architecture. And furthermore, she has felt the burden of this through not being recognized by the Prixer Prize, which was awarded to her partner, Robert Venturi in 1991. Recently, in 2013, two Harvard students, Caroline James and Ariel Aslan Lichten, started a petition, which of course I and many other architects signed to have Denise retroactively be awarded the prize. Despite Prickster's refusal to recognize Denise Scott Brown, her numerous achievements still over the years have won recognition within the architectural community and has received many other awards. She continues to be an inspiration and is notable for her teachings, theories, buildings, master plans, and writing. With this, I want to thank again Denise for speaking with me and sharing her experiences and giving us all the opportunity to listen to her inspiring words. Hello. Hello, Denise. Hi. Can you hear me? Hi. I can hear you. Um, oh, I gather great. we're not we're not seeing each other. We're not <laughs> hearing each other. Is that right? In other words, it's, this is not on, on Skype or anything. Um, so technically, it is kind of a conference call that we are on. So I have some of my colleagues mm -hmm. on this uh, call as well with us, um, but. Uh, I'm also calling you directly from my phone into that conference call. <laughs> yes. No, we can't see your face. We will only be able to hear your voice and then we will um, put some images over it later. Yes. Um, you, will, you will see me frown if I don't like the question. <laughs> yes. Okay. So I'll stop, I'll stop making jokes. I just want to make sure I know where I am. Um, I don't know if. Uh, they want to say hello or not and introduce themselves. Well, I do. I want to say hello to each of them. Uh, All right, thank then. you, D Denise. Thank you so much for doing this. This is Neil Leach here. I'm one of the original yes. organizers of Digital Futures. This is a fantastic thing you're doing. And thank you also, Virginia, for, for hosting this interview. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you. So I, I have your pictures and your questions. Um, and they, they are nice, so the pictures are beautiful, but I have a feeling that your original aim, which was, it's something for young people at the beginnings of their careers, mm -hmm. and um, it's a way to kind of help them keep their hearts up, not lose courage, be excited about the future and all of that. And I'm not sure if the best way to start then is to say, what were all the troubles I had as a woman? <laughs> well, I think it's um, perhaps I was thinking of a lot of those questions because we still face a lot of the same troubles. Um, and oh, so we'd yes, like to know how good. you um, endeared yes. them and how you got over them, because I know I still face a lot of. Yes. Well, look, um, it, let me put it this way. Um, I can do that and I will do that, but not at the very beginning, because I have to tell them what I meant. You know, what, what were the things that were great? What were the things that were, what made my ideas grow? What made my enthusiasm grow? And I say, yes, there are going to be these problems. But with what you have here and with some of the things I've learned about facing them, um, don't be worried about them, but don't, 
what the stones of him. They're, oh, you're coming into a terrible life. I'm warning you. That doesn't seem to lie in with what you said your original aim was. I can, I can do something. I can start with my early childhood. And I also have some um, amusing stories about how I catch on to people who are afraid the way I was afraid fairly early on and what I do about that. Um, but I, I just hate to answer directly those questions. What do you think? You can still use the same pictures in that first thing. You've got lovely pictures of me as a, a small girl and a slightly bigger girl. And I've got a nice story to tell about that. But it's not really about it isn't in a little way about being a woman, but it's about how I came into all that. Does that make sense? Yes, indeed. I, I think that would be great. Um, we could start with that, uh, just talking about um, some of those experiences in your early life uh, and how you came into all these different uh, phases. That would be great. I'm good to write an article about the fact that Waldron was much, much better and Thoreau in a little wooden hut in a wood by a lake with a pencil. And he was much more efficient than all I'm trying to do. So <laughs> in that sense, I will go back in time. But um, let, let me just get myself to those pictures. So look at all the curly hair I had and um, I was four in that first picture and by that time I was already very interested in architecture and that was mainly through my mother and um, but I was interested in a million things through my mother and also my father and they've they've all gone on with me until I can describe them as thought vectors things I saw as a very, very small girl. And then they lived with me most of my life and right on up into designing cities and things like that. And there are a few of those very influential things. So when I was this age and when I, when I was two years old, I already saw the blueprints of the house we were building in 1934. And it was a modern house. And the architect, was known as, um, what was his name? I'm forgetting it. Um, he was a South African architect, and he and my mother were in the same class in architecture school. And finally, he ended up as a professor in sad how the architects end up not practicing, but teaching in, in schools in England and Wales and all over the place. But anyway, um, and the only reason I'm forgetting the name is because it's important I remember it now. Mostly I think I remember it, and maybe I'll remember in a minute or two. But anyway, they were looking at a blue sheet of paper with white lines. Those were called blueprints then. And they were looking at a site and holding those up to the site. And that was the house that he was designing for them. Uh, um, something... Um, uh, old age has funny ways of dodging you with memories and then it has its own means of remembering so it, it will presumably come back but um, he had set the first plans and they were imagining them by standing on the site and I was two years old and just sort of hanging on and looking up but I do remember seeing a funny little square on the top left hand corner separate from the rest of the drawing and I said why did they design a matchbox? But it wasn't a matchbox, it was just a little square you put around a detail there I'm trying to show you. But I'm, my childhood starts out with remembering houses that I was, um, the one I was born in, in what was then Northern Rhodesia, in Ankana. And some people say I was born in Kitwe. I'm proud to say Kitwe did not exist when I was born. It, started, it was incorporated four years later, I was in, in Kana, and it was a little settlement around a mine called in Kana. And um, so that was the house they built, it was probably built out of um, mud bricks. And my mother had been born in southern Rhodesia, which is now Zimbabwe, and she, and she um, 
her parents had come from Latvia and, uh, and, my, and my father's parents from Latvia and Lithuania. And those people were originally, I think, from, um, let me see, I'm doing the same thing. What's, what's the country we're all so concerned about now, at the end of the EU? Uh, um, Ukraine. Ukraine. You see, when you're old, of course you want it, it goes away, but it comes back, or else I've got my iPhone. But anyway, so I think my grandfather was born in Ukraine, and I think the same on the other side, and then there were pogroms, and they moved further into the Baltic states, and those had special traditions themselves, and I grew up with my mother's, my grandmother's Baltic experiences. So her husband died the year I was born, so only hers. And um, my mother's and the whole family's wilderness experiences. They were um, 15 miles out of a town called Bulawayo on a thousand acre farm. And it was lion country. And they had to shoot things. They had to shoot to eat. My mother didn't like to shoot, but she would take what her brothers ate. And she dressed like a boy and also like all women. If you see pictures of, um, um, uh, what's it called? Um, at the, the book about Africa with Meryl Streep. Um, you, you see her wearing shorts and, and short hair and all of that. It was, a, it was a style, but also it was a necessity. And she had amazing stories of encounters she had with snakes and, and leopards. And and then later, when she became very interested in architecture, she studied, worked for an engineer for a while. That was about 1925. And she never talked about the, um, uh, 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 prejudice against women in the office. That came later. That came much later. And so she then, and she loved drawing. And she used to paint and draw, and she surrounded us with books and poems and drawings and all of that. But at, at that time, she went to study at the University of the Zitwater's Ranch, which waters Rand, which is where all the gold was discovered. And that's where I grew up, and all our family, having been born in Northern Rhodesia, then they moved. And um, when I went to enter myself at Witz University and become what they call a Witzy, someone who went to Witz, and it had an amazing tradition of liberality and courage and things like that, and excellent teaching in the first and second year. So I went there, and um, called the dean, but we call him the dean here. The dean heard that I was Phyllis's daughter. He was so thrilled. And so I was welcomed. I was 15 and going to go the next year, and he said, well, why don't you, and we simulated an American experience, have a few, um, uh, uh, have some, some experience with liberal arts more than you got in high school, and I really wanted that. So I spent a year doing that, my goof off year, during which if someone says to me, how did you ever know that? It goes back to what I learned from that year when I wasn't studying. And, and my mother and her uh, brothers had a, um, a governess, an English governess who spoke French as well. And that's what a, an educated lady from Latvia will do if she goes to live in the, in the wilderness. And she saw the, the Romanovs, which was a Russian royalty who were descended from Queen Victoria and spoke English, and the uh, Windsors, English law, law, um, royalty related to them. She saw both of them as her family. English people do that, isn't that right? They, they, they look upon the royal family as part of their family. And so my, we had two royal families and my grand, grandmother talked about Nikki, the, the heir to the Romanovs, and um, about, oh, they were good city. I was four years old and the King of England um, retired and at four, I knew the meaning of the word morganatic, which meant he was marrying a commoner, and she was American nonetheless. Oh, she was worse than a, a, a commoner. She was also an American, you have to put it that way. And um, so 
there's, I had an involvement with all that, but then all the same sorts of things in South Africa as well were part of my background and the, the fights and the arguments there. And then my mother's experiences of, um, of sitting up and doing her homework at a tree, which she loved to do when she was a little girl on the farm. And she suddenly had this experience. She just said, you must run. And she got up. And as she got up, she heard a low grunt, and it was a leopard right above her in the tree. And then she had another experience where there was a whole lot of farm workers there gathered around a tree, and some of her, a couple of her brothers were there, and, um, and they looked up at her, and everyone was looking up at the tree, and there was an awful croaking going up in the tree. And it was a snake croaking. But snakes don't croak. It was a great big snake, and he'd got a frog caught in his throat. <laughs> and the frog not suggested that was croaking from up there. So, and then when I talked to my professor at the time, Professor Mandine, and um, I said, he said, oh, you're Phyllis's daughter. And he got, he was a very stuffy man, puffed up stuffy. He suddenly got a wide smile on his face, and he said, I remember your mother at the end of the studio by the by the chalkboard throwing chalk at all us men at the other end. She was furious. And he said, I said, well, what did you do to her? He said, I can't remember what we did to her. So when I talked about my mother's adventures, I said, look at Phyllis. She can manage snakes. She can manage leopards. And she can manage architects. And so that's the kind of spirit that she went at things in. Now, when I was in grade school, I then wanted to be a teacher. And then a little bit later, I, I wanted to be various things, but still hung on to architecture because we had this very beautiful house. And if any of you know the um, principal's house at the Country Day School in Philadelphia by Les Cars, it was very much like that. And it was a joy to live in. But to me, all my friends could open the doors of their houses at three. I expect I had friends at three and four because they were low, low round knobs in the traditional house. Mine, it was a modern house, very, very cubist. And it had a steel lever handle. And I had to reach up way over my head. I'm doing it. You can't see me. I'm doing it now. To, to reach that door when I was five. And that was such a life change for me. And then also managing the spiral stairs on the balcony. I used to play it at sailors and ships on that. And then we had another uh, black and white tile stair with a, with a metal rail going up and then a half around for the landing because that was the magnificent play of um, magnificent and correct light on natural, on um, geometric solids. That's the Corbusier describing what you needed in a, in a house. And we had that as you entered, all the solids coming together. And the one was the staircase. I used to swing around on that rail as I came on the staircase and then go on, on and up. And then my grandmother used to come up, thank God, a little later. It was very lonely to be in that house with big wide windows and not a grown up around. And you could hear her. Now, she was an elegant lady, but she loved to wear high heels, back to slippers with ostrich feathers on the front. All of that now in Johannesburg was also like that in, in Lion Country. And also a teapot made in Birmingham. Yes, made in Birmingham. Before that, the wine glasses she used when she was still Latvian. And so I would hear her flap, flap, up those steel stairs, not steel stairs, tile stairs. Um, and that was very reassuring to me. So all of these are the mixtures that I go through and then lying on my parents' bed in the afternoon after school, I would, they had portholes and I would watch the sun come in at the porthole and the circle of the sun changed to be an ellipse. And I slowly watched these two little circles becoming ellipses. That's very influential for me as well. And then all the books my mother read us and all sorts, grown-up books and baby books and all the drawings we did and all the cutouts we made, et cetera, et cetera. 
came into that life. So by the time I had got to high school, I had successively wanted to be many things. And the last one was a librarian, because you be amongst all those books. And then I got into um, at the, the upper school, and there were um, there were other people around who had other interests. And I became I became friends with some people who were very interested in archaeology. And my mother came and joined also the South African Archaeological Society. It was dis- discovering early humans, and it also took us into the into the bush felt again, which she just loved. Their homeschooling had had many, many uh, days of nature study, going into the bush felt and learning everything from this English um, governess who also taught them to speak French. And that was lucky because we all needed French in our lives one way or another. Um, so that's kind of the only other thing is my, my sister being born, and I'm two, and we're still in Mrs. Millen's house. Her name, no, Mrs. Tenbergen's house, her name was. I remember the name. I remember being in a room alone. All the adults were in the room with my mother, and I'm two, but I didn't know that my little sister was being born. Well, they didn't know if it was a girl or a boy in those days. Uh, my little sibling was being born. And I remember being in the living room and I was all alone. And everyone's attention was away from me for a first time. And I pushed the screen door open and I went out onto a long strip porch across the length of the house. And I looked out and I saw the world. I saw Africa. I saw, it was wonderful. And it had bantams in it and hens in it and pine trees in it. And I was having a great time Discovering the world, you know, like what is uh, something silent on a on a who knows keep silent on a peak in somewhere or other. That's looking out at the world, and then what are you doing alone? And it was the nurse they had to look after my sister came out and all flustered because I was there having my initial world discovery. So by that time. By the time I was to go to university, I <coughs> I wanted to be an architect. But other funny things that happened, like um, my grandmother had lived in London. She went to see her remaining family. Most of them had gone to Africa. Her remaining family in Latvia and Lithuania. And um, just as well because they were killed. But um, when, when she got back. She didn't go back to Africa. She lived in London for a while and she became a kind of a hostess for refugees coming from her own country. From, and we met um, Isaiah Berlin as doing part of the National Gallery. And I wish I'd known what my relative told me when he got back. He said, you know, his name is not really Berlin, it's Bersin, B-E-R-S-I-N. And that's one of our family names. So we had a wonderful time with Isaiah when he was on the board there. His, his jokes were marvelous, and Bob and he got on awfully well. I just didn't know enough to know that he was probably a relative. Um, but the, the point was that she 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 didn't meet him, but she met various other ones. She tried to help get him to universities as young professors and things like that in London. And then when I was 13, there came a message from someone who said, I'm so sorry I didn't know you were here. Now it's my last night and tomorrow I'm leaving. But I am giving a lecture at the university. And would you like to come and listen to the lecture? Then you can take me back to the hotel and we can talk there. And that's all I have to go back to England after that. And he was teaching at Leeds. And um, afterwards I thought about it. And just a little while ago I said, now I remember his name. And so I went to Google and I looked under the name and there was this man, there was a picture. Yes, that's the way he looked when I met him. I'd had a great time. I listened to his lecture and he made perfect sense. It was about subhuman species in Africa that he was studying. And so after the lecture, I was 13, I must have been squeaking. And I said, "Um, you, 
you said so much, and I understood it all. And then when the students started to speak, I couldn't understand a thing. And he said, oh, students are always like that. And then I looked, and his name was Baranowski. And he did a famous series on some man called The Ascent of, the, uh, the Ascent, the Ascent of Human Beings or something like that. And he was a very well-known professor indeed. And I think without even realizing it, I attended one of his lectures in England before I realized it was the same guy. So uh, sitting there at the tip of Africa, feeling cut off from the whole wide world, I think I got a much richer childhood. So many refugees in, in Johannesburg, and they taught music, they taught singing, they taught English, they taught um, one of them. Lovely stories is he must have been a doctor, short little man, and um, he used to be a, a lab assistant when we were taking um, uh, physics. And as a girl, I didn't have much physics at school. It's bad enough to get science teachers for men in the war, so they had someone who studied science and taught us a little physics, and then they had someone who studied botany and she taught teachers a whole lot. So. And they put girls together in partnership to build their experiments. So we followed the diagrams and we did it all, all together. And then we, we, we felt very lost, but we kept on and we did it. And then we had it all put together. And then we called this little man over. And I think he was Mr. Lichtschitt. And he was a happy, this kind of Berlin German with a sense of humor. I say they have a, a, a red, rich red wine mind and a white, crisp biscuit mind put together. So he looks at our experiment and he says, um, it's very good, yes, it is all together, very well put together. And when you turn it on, it will explode. He <laughs> says, they're laughing at us as, as we do it. Well, I remember all these lovely things about scholarship that have allowed me to want to be a teacher as well as everything else. That's one of your questions, why? For some of those reasons. Um, now, all right, I've done a long shot on, at how childhood memories do things and influence me. And I could go on talking about you know, how I came to learn Italian in a, in a similar way when we went on, a, on an Italian boat. And that was the first journey away from home. But I think I better leave that because you can't spend 54 hours with me. And so if we go on from that, um, you can see I'm structuring my course to get more breadth than architects want. And I'm always doing that. And when I, when I start um, at this, all the people there had the same outlook. But when I got into third year, the nastiness in architecture began to take over. And by that, I mean destroying people at juries and things like that. And But they're much worse in England on those things than they were in South Africa. But it meant that at the end of my, well, at, at the end of my second year, that was, and you know, it meant at the end of my third year, I left and I went to England because we had an internship program, which meant you worked in an office or before the war, you could go to the um, antiquities and you could study the Roman and Greek architecture, but that ended with the war. That's what Rex Martinson did. And um, so, and Rex Martinson was very well known to the Smithsons, but he was also in my mother's class in South Africa. So anyway, um, I went thinking I'll do a, a year of internship in England. And that's another one of those years where I can't believe everything I did. And I still worked for Frederick Gibbons, and I also um, worked for um, Emma Goldfinger. That was an experience worse than death, and any resemblance to a human being is entirely superficial. <laughs> it need me to say much more than Emma Goldfinger, but once when I met him in, at the AA at dinner, when I was already coming here to lecture, um, he looked up at me and said, um, you are an American. All the Americans at, at uh, the uh, thing of, of Paris were there's something bad about being rich. And um, one of the English, Englishmen there, Tim Sturgis, he said, 
Yes, like rich, like rich Hungarians, hey, Erno. And so Erno was put down. And then he began jibbing me again. And I said, I worked for you. You didn't work for me. And did you learn a lot? I said, I learned nothing. <laughs> After he said to, to him, sir, just, um, that lady really hates me. But um, it, it was revenge. But so now, where do you want to go from that? I went to AA. I did. I had a wonderful time there. But I was also in love with Robert Scott Brown, who'd been in school with me at, at this. And as soon as he finished his fifth year, he came to join me in London. And we both were at the AA in a, in a year on tropical architecture. Uh, studying English social mores in India was not my way of studying tropical architecture, really. But there it was. And, um, and also, it was deepest of winter, and we were designing for hot, humid countries. But it was fun, and Robert had a great time. At the end of that, we married. And then that, um, by the way, we had a, a, a honeymoon in Yugoslavia. And we, we did adventurous things. Robert and I acquired a Morgan car, three-wheeler with a, a spare wheel at the back, and everything you could dream of except we really didn't like it when it suddenly broke down and had to be turned on with a one of those handles. You get out in the middle of Piccadilly in the morning and in a huge, huge traffic jam, and there you are getting your your head and your shoulder banged by the turning wheel that you had to do to start it in. Luckily, the whole of London was laughing at us on that thing in Piccadilly. So we didn't mind it. No one minded too much. But we had excitement like that. The architects at, at, at Vic were very left and very dedicated to equality and things like that. Architects at the AA were cut into two groups. The ones who got major scholarships and whose brother had to leave school at seven before the war and now said they were a major scholarship to Cambridge or to England and very gruff because they were not nicely treated, treated by upper class architects who looked upon the AA as their place. And I, as a colonial, I had some, some things to say. I knew Afrikaans people, and I knew what happened in the Boer War, and it was not good. And um, so I could tell those snobby English that the English had special allowances for manners, for gardeners and colonials. And, and, and most of my friends were amongst the other group. And then we made friends with London Cockneys, who were members of the Morgan Club. And those were the warmest friendships, and it was a lot of fun for us. Meanwhile, I'd become very interested in England in urbanism as part of architecture. And um, we, we used to go hitchhiking in England a lot, looking at different things you should see. Um, now, um, what happened was that we wanted to go, as many people in England wanted to go, to America. And it turned out if we were going to go, we could go on the British um, allowance and we could get in within six weeks. But then Robert would become subject to being um, enlisted. So we said, no, we're going to... We, we, we had money from, from, from our honeymoon. No one could send us gifts. We said, we, we're going to go and travel. So the first honeymoon, um, well, one was a honeymoon, and Robert said, well, I guess we go to two weeks to Paris, don't we? Like, that's what everyone does. I said, no, we go for five weeks to Chakin and Yugoslavia. And that's what we did. And again, sleeping in the houses of peasants and sleeping in cornfields and the one night when we, we saw no more cars coming by, and there was this cornfield, and there was this little hut. And we went there, and we found two Serbians in the hut, and they couldn't speak English. Robert could speak a lot of German, but it didn't help here. So we had to do everything by signs. And we said, there's no more cars coming. And could we, could we share your hut with you? They said, sure, sure. <laughs> 
and they told us about Macedonia's cariba, which means Macedonian fish, which means they cut um, a beautiful long thin red pep peppers, very hot, and corn, and they made a stew at the heart of this world. We all sat and had the stew, and just as they started, I saw a great big American Buick go by very slowly that we didn't catch, and I said, the hell with the Buick. And then we slept the night there, and we couldn't speak anything, so I got one of our drawing pads, and I drew a big picture of a pig, and we each of us labeled the name of the pig in our own language, and we probably spent about two hours quite happily doing that. And the next day as we left, I saw something just just over the shoulder. We sit on the grass and wait for it. And it was, you never knew what would come and whether it would be a day or 30 minutes or what. And I saw round stones there. And um, I went through them and I found it was a very old Jewish cemetery. And it had um, stars of David and Hebrew on it and um, mainly round-headed tombstones. It was very strange to find that like that. But also, nearby, there was also a Muslim one and also a Catholic one, or what it, whatever it would have been, Russian Orthodox, probably. And so it, all those mixtures there and those strange... And the other thing was, seeing things that I remembered later, well, we were in Israel and we saw a mosque, and that mosque was... Um, it went down from the sidewalk. It took steps down into an open courtyard, and that's where you washed your hands and your feet and all of that and went in. Then the tower rose up above the sidewalk. It was the most beautiful composition of things. And without my realizing it, when I went back to the AA, I, I, um, I, that was before Robert came. I was hitchhiking in, in Israel, visiting relatives there too. And um, so... What, what I did was I used that as the basis for my thesis where with Brian Smith, one of those English students um, who came, his father had been a tailor and he went to become a car, car worker in um, Luton. And Brian had the highest IQ in Luton and that they got him into the AA. And um, he, he and I designed... Um, a Welsh village, a little town called M Mardi, and we added housing on a hillside to a Welsh village, um, learning from the Smithsons, but also making it stepped housing. And the whole thing was built on the components of that mosque. One element at the street level, one element below street level, lawn below street level, and then one high element like the, like the high wall. Um, of the mosque, of the tower. And I didn't realize I'd been influenced in that way, but that went on with me. What I saw influenced greatly what I did. And that was called study learning. Now, someone better say, let's get off to something else. I, I can tell you about, you see, what I can tell you is this. I was, I've explained to you an arc that went long, low, and scary um, through, London, through South Africa. And then I met nasty juries and people said, no, that's all wrong. And then they couldn't tell you what was right. By the way, what happened to me was that they did that. In fact, our dean did that. No, no, couldn't you realize you shouldn't have done that? What he meant was make it look cubist like the things he did. When I realized that, I realized that was a, a character fault and it wasn't going to help me get an education. And um, so I went to someone else I trusted very much, and that was a structures professor, Manfred Marcus, from Berlin. And there he was with a, a structures practice opposite the university, and he gave us our structures lectures. And he was full of humor, but he didn't, his eyes were not too good. And um, so, and it, it became known that. If you had a problem, you could go for a tutorial with him at his office just across the road. Um, but you had to bring a sandwich and have lunch with him. Not for him, for you. And also, if you were a pretty young girl, it was particularly easy to do that. 
slight weakness on the part of this very dear man. But I took advantage of the weakness, but it didn't mean it was anything at all. It was just he tried to help me get through and understand some parts of structure, but I only learned in the end by helping to teach someone else. That's the only way I could learn it. So it's finding ways to teach myself. And, and then um, at the end, I took up my courage and I said, and this is because of the professor who was being so mean in the, in the studio, I have a need for structure in my life. Now I'm 17. I'm saying I need structure in my life. I don't know what's good and what's bad. And you see, he said to me um, something like, he was very polite. I could see he must be laughing. And that she's 17, she wants structure. I'm 67, I still want structure. But anyway, she didn't say that. He just said, um, you must just go on and be patient. And then I added, and I can't like Brahms. He used to have his students for musical evenings, give them dinner and give them Brahms or whatever. And that's what German professors used to do. And so um, when, when he said, you must be patient, you'll like Brahms one day, I took it at that. And I didn't look as much. And truly, I can say to other students, um, look, what happened to me was, in the end, I got so keen on what I was doing, like when I was discovering that I could use that, that mosque and make a beautiful little town, which allowed you to go uphill and down and get by on a car, but there only certain places. It was a beautiful little project, and that was my thesis at the AA. So what I realized, you're not going to know about structure. You're just going to know you love this thing and you want to work on it and it's going to solve this problem, and you're going to do more and more and more like that. And then one day you'll have another student who's a, a worry about structure. And that happened. That happened about seven years ago, around about then, and I was in Mexico City, and there was a big, big lecture um, and I, I gave for students, young students at the University of Mexico. And so I started out by saying, when I was in your year, I felt very lost. Anyone else? Does anyone else here feel very lost? And no one answered. But after the lecture, and my lecture was much too long, the, the students were thrilled. They walked out with their hands, their four fingers crossing and saying, I said to them, cross your four fingers and look at two roads crossing. And remember that that's where you put the skyscrapers. And if you know that, you know about economic theory of city form. So they and the faculty walked out looking at their fingers, which was very nice. But um, then one of them came up with a boyfriend, and she said, I have that same problem you had. And she began to, uh, and her boyfriend said, well, actually, what she meant to say was she wants this person. And I said, no. I don't know these people. I could harm them, but I could help. Like anything I could help if I didn't do it well enough. So I just didn't take her hand. I took his hand. And I said, she's very, very lucky to have you. And you're really, really very sympathetic. And that's marvelous. But if you do this for her, she'll never find out what she wants to do. And that's all I said to them. And I really pray I said the right thing to them. So why am I being a teacher? You have to work it out from that. Um, why am I so happy we studied languages? Because I think when we were in Yugoslavia, it saved our lives, probably. But I only realized that just recently. We were walking along to a toward a town called Ochrid, way down in the south. And there was a big lake there. And we knew also you could get a bath there. It was very difficult to find bars. We used to bathe in rivers and all sorts of things. And so um, as we were walking, I had my backpack, what we call rucksack. I don't Americans say backpack, and I never heard what English said. But I had mine on my back, very big. And Robert was walking a little ahead. And there were hillsides. And all of a sudden, there was a funny pair of clicks, click, 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 like that. And we looked up, 
And there on the top of the hillside, we saw two soldiers with about 100 feet between them. And they could shout to each other and they could shout to us, do you speak Serbian? No, thank God, Robert spoke German. He was very talented at languages. And um, they, they said, what are you doing? Well, we knew every time we hit a village, you'd be surrounded by villagers and amazing things. Some of them had worked in Detroit in 1922 in the automobile factories, then come back home. But so it's very strange. But these ones said, what are you doing here? We said, well, we're going to Deba, it was called. And they said, you can't be here. It was coming here. We've seen the signs. The citizenry shall voluntarily go to greet their great father, Tito. So we, we had no intention to go and greet any great father, but there we were. And what they had done is just cocked their, their, their guns, just ready to shoot us. So when they found we were students and we were hitchhiking, they just made sure we got on the next truck. And there we were standing in the back of the truck. I held tightly onto Robert, and there were about 30 construction workers in that truck with us. And we had other delightful journeys of workers and trucks where they stop on the way and they give Robert like them a Himbia, which was, no, uh, not, no, Himbia was in Amia, strawberry juice, but they'd have a, a big, um, what do they call it? Um, Vladko, not Vladko, something like that, big dose of alcohol. And it may, it may have been a saint's day and they may have been communists but they were rolling around in that truck. So that was the story of that kind of adventure. And then, of course, we, we finally we went back and finished working. I worked for Dennis Clark Hall as well. He was a gentleman that was a rest. And very interesting what he was doing too. And then um, we decided we'd go back home. And here comes the sad part. Because it's just as well Robert went home, because when Robert got to America, at the end of the first year, he just killed the motor accident. So he saw his mother and stepfather, and his father and stepmother, back in South Africa before he left. And um, when we got to America, our heads were. Well, what, first we went back and we started asking question after question after question. And we went to Soweto and we talked to the people there about what they were doing and why. And it really stored me up for not doing the same thinking as the Smithsons were doing. We, we were very impressed with them and I was very disappointed to learn that when we learned Clearly, a city form it was going to be economics, not architecture. We wanted to leave, and I'm very pleased I didn't leave because I've managed to <laughs> critique the Athens Charter and the whole world way of looking at modernism, urbanism. I adore Le Corbusier as an architect, so I see through him in some ways. But as far as urbanism is concerned, I have a bag of tools so much more useful for me and for you, which is to do with urbanism, um, and so much more understandable if you've seen certain things. So Robert and I arrived with a million questions to ask, and we, were, we had lessons in urban sociology with Herbert Gans, who was a young professor then, and he, like, he just moved to live in Urbertown as a participant, a, a participant observer, sociologists called it, finding out how people live there, and he wrote a book about it. And he also wrote a book about uh, urban villagers, people who came from you know, all over the world, came to America and lived as, as they lived in villages, but in the center of New York. He wrote that book too. And so he invited us to dinner. I remember um, he was only about a year or two older than me. And um, at a certain point, he said, and, and Mr. Gans, what do you believe? Professor Gans, what do you believe? I said, he said, call me Herb. So the planning school at Penn was very liberal, very free thinking, very much involved in conflict between happening things. And students like the ones I had this, I said, not the ones in England or the ones in the architecture school. And you could learn a whole lot 
from those studios. And Dave Crane, who was our studio master, he um, wouldn't even though he knew our names. I didn't know the student advisor system. He'd seen pictures of us. He knew what to look for. Hello, Robert. Hello, Denise. Come in. My name is David Crane. The first thing he said was um, he too had grown up in Africa. He was the son of American missionaries in Kenya. And so he really directed us for a coursework that will allow us to do what was in our hearts, go back to South Africa and work for South Africa, work for a better South Africa. And, but the irony is when Robert died and I was so protected and helped at, the, at Penn and able to do work in two departments, I had a joint department there when I joined the faculty, um, I decided that for a while at least I would stay and get those skills. And I kept on attending course after course and teaching and all of that. And um, just recently, one of the students from when I first taught in the planning school, he came to me at Bob's memorial service. And he said, do you remember me, Jim Yellen? I said, how could I forget you? <laughs> I said, you remember what you did to me? You remember what I had to say to you? I had to say, that work wasn't good enough for graduate student work. It's not good enough for undergraduate student work. It's not good enough for high school. And he became a very good friend, very good friend. And he was very interesting. He is. He, I said, of course, you didn't go into planning, did you? Who of us really did that after Nixon and Reagan? He said, no, I became a diplomat. And I did much of my work in Africa, all over Africa. And I was sent four times to South Africa to work on Soweto because of what you had taught us about it. It was such a lovely feeling of triumph. And um, so, and then I said to him, weren't you mad at me when I said all those things to you? He said, Denise, I knew what I was doing. What he meant was he had been teasing me. So, that school was a really good place to be an architect. Now, I want you to say where you want to I think I'm taking you to a place where um, Bob and I are about to meet. I'm a sorrowing young widow. Um, we begin, we're in, we're teaching the same thing. I've got a joint department appointment. I teach an introduction to urban design to architects, to non architects. And introduction to planning, to architects, and introduction to studio, to both of them. And that means um, one course in one semester, and two, um, and one stu and a studio in each semester, and time for research. And um, it was a wonderful life like that. But what happened was, Bob had come back from the American Academy. He'd gone to Princeton and he studied where I was studying at the AA. I studied um, John Somerton. And I went twice to his courses. I just ordered them two years running. I was that redhead South African sitting at the front. And it was very, very interesting, particularly when he talked about our mannerism. And then Robin Middleton. Um, if you're from England, you may know Robin Middleton. He was at Cambridge. And he was a friend of ours since childhood in South Africa. And so he came and joined me in England the same time Robert did. And then he went to Cambridge and he fell out with English Design Review in offices. He couldn't believe they're even worse than in South Africa and just as bad as in America. And so he didn't go into architecture there. He went into history of architecture and he was very bookish and very skilled. And so he studied under Pesna and I took the Pesna books with me. Pesna had been in South Africa and he also had us to dinner for that reason. And he he had books on that mannerism. Well, outside of European, European architecture with a lot of stress on mannerism. And Somerton gave many, many courses, many, many lectures on Somerton in his courses. So the result was when, when, when Bob Venturi got back from American Academy in Rome, he was only 12 days before 
discovered mannerisms because of a, a visiting um, student of history at the American Academy. So he had looked at it only briefly, and no one can say that Bob spent all his time in the library when he was American Academy with all those wonderful churches. But no, he didn't. He went through all those churches and then again and then again. So when he got back, he found no one in America, no one pen, at least not in architecture, knew about mannerism. And then suddenly he finds a South African planner. She knows a whole lot more than he does about mannerism. Will you have dinner with me? Will you come and look at what I'm doing? And then I was teaching the first series course about introduction to theories of architecture, not theory, theories. And he was teaching the second course, and his became the famous book, um, Complexity and Contradiction in Architecture. But he and I were feeding each other. You like this for what you're doing. I like this what I'm doing. And we were closely together, but not in parallel courses in the first year. He just we dated and we went. I taught him about I can like like something worth I can like something worse than you can like. We played a game like that about mannerism. And then the next year, um, my course first and his second. And then I began doing for his course what I did for mine, helping the theory relate to the design of the studio. When no architect sat in the lawn, I'd go up in that studio and commit mayhem with his students. Have you thought of this? Have you thought of this? They were all very grateful. And then I started doing the same thing for Bob's course, too. Then we became very close friends. And, of course, I was a widow. And um, he, who knew what, what he was going to do? He, but he, was, he published his first book, and then people saw his mother's house, and I criticized him on the mother's house in the last month because it took many, many years. And um, at, the, at the, uh, the, the parties, the, the skits they called them, they were always teasing Bob about um, Robert Venturi is still designing his mother's house. But it was his odyssey as to how he taught himself. And then he left and went to Yale, and I left and went to Berkeley. And it was the free speech movement at Berkeley. And boy, did I have a time with those students. <laughs> I enjoyed it. I, all them, 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 them. <laughs> the same way as, as Jim Young, just bursting out the things. And I gave them as good as they, as they gave me, which meant they could be free and I could be free. Now, this Jim Yellen has written an article in the book that is being written about my work. And they've taken different teachers and people. How did you manage to do studios like that? I said, because the planners were much better at understanding what a studio could do than the architects could. So um, Jim Yellen has written about the fact that they were, when he came to planning school, and he came from a very good undergraduate school, and he was very interested in the the um, views on aesthetics of certain famous philosophers during the ages. And he did a special study with me about that. Good for me, because I couldn't bring myself to read those philosophers. They're much too dense. So he did the reading, and then I did the critiquing. But the first semester, he, he was pretty imaginative, but he couldn't draw, he couldn't think like an architect. And um, he wrote for this article, when I first got to Penn, the two youngest teachers in the planning school were Denise Scott Brown and one year older, Paul Davidoff. Paul Davidoff was a very great social planner. And I was meant to be an architect planner, but I was teaching them about housing and people and, and transportation and how, to, how the pattern of cities ought to be reflected by the economics and by many natural forces and all of that. And he showed where we coughed up that we were having. We would lean back in our chairs and we'd um, look back through the, the doors and argue with each other. And leaning on the backs of our chairs, we didn't fall over, but and just it was about three three feet, one meter corridor. And so people were gathering around us. We didn't realize that. So, our whole class would be around in the back of the corridor there, listening to what we were saying. And then I remember, I, I did this only once, but it was really noticeable. 
I said, why don't we all go up and have a cup of coffee and you can all join in. So the Khan came by. It was more interesting shown in a planning situation and in young faculty members than he liked. But there we were telling them about all these things, answering their questions, but it went on for a whole long time. And um, so after that, the students, those were my friends. And some of them became very famous. If you ever heard Barack Obama talk about that wonderful politics and prose coffee shop in Washington, the best one he knew, and it was. And we went and talked there because Carla Cohen, his owner, was my student. Big, round, roly poly young woman, one night in chairs in the studio. She meant to be leading the team. You know, you're the leader, but then you have a student who's meant to be organizing and helping people get there. She's saying to me, Armando has gone back to first principles and it's four hours before our presentation. And she was weeping. And so I began weeping. And she said, you're not supposed to weep. You're supposed to comfort me. I've never forgotten that. And she had a smock just covered all over and colored pastel, which we made land use now. In the middle of her nose, a great big blue blob she didn't know about, crying away. So you can see, and then suddenly in the studio, someone's done this terrible piece of architecture. Where's Denise? They're all going to come persecute me by a project I wouldn't have liked either. It's not me, I didn't do it. And you get the atmosphere of, of what made learning fun and what made the subject seem important. And I've used all those subjects, ironically, planned for my use in Africa in architecture, not only planning, in architecture, and in architecture in um, America. Also China, Japan, Morocco, England, France, Italy, I think that's Germany. So where do, you, where do you want me to go? You, you want to know now some questions, like what did I feel about the petition? Sure, you could you could talk about that. Um, but also, I mean, I think that you've given such a great background of your experiences. Um, I'm wondering, you were, you're talking about uh, Penn and some of your time at Penn. And so one of the questions we did have was also, um, uh, about uh, your time at Penn and uh, why you wanted to protect the Fine Arts Library? Well, the thing is, I was formed by the architect. You see, in England, if you were a good architect, a very good design, you really wanted to go to America and study city planning because for the next 10 or 15 years, it was all good to be urban renewal. And you can see what Prince Charles thought of that urban renewal. But anyway, so the point is, uh, we were keen like that too. And when we got there, we found it wasn't anything like that. Um, and then Dave Craig said, look, for where you want to go, this planning, not the planning you think you want, will give you what you need. So we trusted him. And he was a wonderful studio teacher. We had a marvelous time. We took the plan of um, Sandigar that Luke Hobbesi had done. We said, Let's take it that he didn't do it, and let's now do a plan which will accept the reality that when you get a new city there, you get many big government buildings, and then you get swarms and swarms of migrants coming in. So the problem we're talking about so much today, that was the first studio problem we tackled. How do you deal with, with um, people who are going to be squatters? See? And I knew a lot about that from Africa. And we, we designed a new city. And it, it was, you see, when I was in elementary school, so all the way back again, and I was seven, seven years old and in second grade. And um, we had a, a school that taught by the Dewey system, learning by doing. So it was like studio with Dave Crane. We made a model of a primitive house made of mud. Primitive Egyptian house. There were all kinds. We didn't do the African one. We did the Egyptian one. I think it was an Egyptian one. But meanwhile, you had to, um, we, six of us and our Canadian teacher had to find a way to erect this other big 
plank of plywood. And so she had some tall nails and she knocked the nail in and the eye was, then you do, it was an African hat because what the, the little webbed pieces of branch are called utingo, utingo. So you put this in and out between the verticals that you put in. So she knocks the first one in. And then someone else starts knocking the second one in, the first one pops out. And we try again and again, no way, the stuff is just going to pop out. And six little kids and one teacher ended the evening very frustrated. It wasn't the evening, it was, we got out at 3 p.m., I think. Very frustrated. And then by the next morning, she worked out what to do. And there was elation because you just put a little glue in the bottom and hold it for a while and it won't come off. So we, 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 we cooked the, the, um, the bricks and we, we made those and a, a roof. And at the end, we all, um, we rattled out all those things. Each kid took home one of the things that they made. So it was really, you learn by doing. Uh, another one was, we, we made a play out of Treasure Island. And we made the costumes, we studied the geography. We, um, we converted the, the prose into, um, a, 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 what do you call it? thing that, that you use to learn from your, your own part. We had those. And also, um, I we, we had to make our own costumes and we had to make our own weapons. And, and again, it was great fun. And the teacher got so involved too. And so I knew about that system. And we'd done that at Vicks. We'd had a course in um, research into kitchens. And another one of research into, um, I can't remember, but we also built a little building. We built a small tennis shelter for the tennis court. And the instruction came out, the girls are not to pick up 92 pound um, bags of cement. <laughs> they are this we would. <laughs> but anyway, we had a lovely time with that. And um, someone has recently found the photographs of that and published them in the Vets magazine. And just that group work and group work on something that's fun is what I've tried to introduce. And then people like um, Sylvia Levin, who's doing the essay on my, my studio at, at, um, at UCLA, she said, who taught you to do this? And I said, a third grade teacher, Dave Crane. And then that, when we had debates with the planning faculty, they were very good at analyzing where planning went wrong and where, you know, they, where they should be teaching differently and how you can't have all studios run by a guru like Lou Khan because you're not going to learn everything. You have to have other kinds of studios as well. And so that's, that's I think, the answer there. Great. Um, um, when I, can I talk about getting into practice? Would you like that? Yes, I would like that a lot. You see, I'd be in and out of Bob's office, and we actually I worked with them on a competition. That's the Thermo Fountain competition. And also, um, Bob was at my juries. I was at his juries. And, and, and then he, when I knew he was the only person on the faculty at Penn who would not put his nose up at giving it a studio in Las Vegas, but I was already planning one when I was at, um, at, at, at UCLA and I was intending to teach it the next semester. And we persuaded them to teach everything through studio, which meant when I ran studio, I was responsible for the, the um, intellectual work of um, four or five lectures, as well as the the design and intellectual work of the studio. And I had to build up a joint faculty who would come and work with me. And I went through this wonderful school with its marvelous teachers and I got the best. And I had them come and talk about their field in relation to a problem we were doing. And I, I, I was just thrilling. And then I wrote up all the, all the work programs and all the, the bibliographies and 
all of that. He said, how could you do all that? Because Dave Crane had me do it with him for about six times before I started on my own. And um, so that, that's, that's, in a way, the story. And then I had these students, two, two German students, and they said, we left Germany because we're not wanting to do little houses. And here you are, you're having us do little houses again. Very disappointed what they found I was doing. But the other people, they are very interested and fascinated. And um, they're looking at the housing in Los Angeles, looking at all sorts of things. Um, so that's, and, and then I invited Bob to come and be on the jury for the studio I gave first at um, Los Angeles, which was, I took, it's not the boardwalk, but the broad walk that goes in front of Venice and Santa Monica, and a little suburb I stayed on between Venice and Santa Monica, whose name I forget. Beautiful little house. And I just lived in a little Los Angeles cottage. And you looked out, and there were two more houses with their front porches. And then there was the beach, the broad walk, a parking lot, and then the beach, and then China. And it was marvelous. And um, the neighbors used to come out and sit on the steps in the evening and watch the sun go down. That's a wonderful life. And um, Bob came and stayed with me there. And I took him to Las Vegas. And he'd never seen anything like that. I knew a lot about Las Vegas because my parents were there. My grandparents had been there. Um, my grandparents sent us wonderful things from New York parties when they went to visit. And I just loved all the fufu and stuff that seemed to come out of everywhere else. And... Um, so that already, and my dad loved um, theme parks. Wherever he went, I wanted to go sit in the theme park. Look at all the people. Isn't this lovely? And so I'm sort of born and bred into that in a way. Then um, I had had trouble at Penn, and the architect says, yeah, you can't join our group who's studying the Smithson. You're in planning. You can't do that. We don't want you. And snobs, they haven't done anything here with that stuff. We had that problem, and I got to UCLA, and I had a problem with tenure. And um, I was the only one who could run an interdisciplinary studio like that. The other guy had to run um, studios on, um, you know, those um, huge um, studios of buildings, 80, 80 stories high. And that was, was, why am I forgetting the name of where I hate it? I have a huge building, that's all one big block. He gave studios on that. He came from Harvard. And um, so no one knew how to support me. And the dean, he, the dean liked to dump things on other people, which all deans want to do. And he was not a strong person. And he, um, he this other guy, bullied me a whole lot and said, you shouldn't be teaching this and why are you doing that? And then the dean said, well, Denise, you and Henry each have a problem. Your problem is that you're a woman and Henry's problem is that he's Chinese. And I said, God, protect me from this. And so then it came that um, the dean took me to the, the, the overall um, the, he isn't a dean, he was the head of student affairs. And because they were wanting to, um, I, had take, I had some time off to prepare for lecturing. And he said, no, no, you must come back and you must teach me next semester. And I said, if you're going to offer me an assistant professorship, I won't. And um, so they took me to this person and he began pontificating, my dear, my dear. Um, join the family as, a, as an assistant professor, my dear. I said, no. I said, I had not expected to be associated with an institution where they take publish or perish seriously. I could see him getting mad. And then he gave a lecture, and he had a point, I had to admit. He said, when, you, when people... Um, don't have something to meet as a, as a goal. They teach the same old thing year after year after year. 
And you should see some of those professors with their yellow papers, their yellowed papers. And I didn't say to him, look back, you'll find those are the ones with tenure. And it wasn't a you know, as, as far as I'm concerned, whether you have tenure or not, you're going to do that. And from my point of view, I'm not going to do it. Well, anyway, I just not, didn't quite make sense what I said there because they had tenure and they had nothing else to do. And yet he's, he's sort of saying, therefore, I should have tenure. It didn't work. Well, I shouldn't have tenure. I wasn't going to do it either. But um, what, what happened was that, first of all, the head of urban planning in Los Angeles, or Cal Hamilton, he was the head of the whole planning commission. He was, he was very happy to say, I'm one of diseases faculty. Here's my boss, he'd say. <laughs> so oh, then she guy with a sense of humor. Here's my boss. So he supported me. And then the other person on our three-person faculty then said, she's very, very good, and there's no one else in the country who can do this interdisciplinary teaching for a whole semester and keep them going that way. And so finally, they went to Martin Myerson, who was the head of Berkeley, and he, he knew me too, and he worked it all out. But the other guy, the, my dean said, um, she hasn't been paid yet, and Foster Sherwood, the head of to those affairs, he said, um, that's easy. I'll soon, I'll soon write, I'll soon, soon fix it up. He re reached for the telephone. And, and George Dudley said, no, she won't accept pay. So what? So I just held out. And then Martin Martin said, look, pull their heads together and said, make her a, 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 temporary, um, a, a temporary professor for the end of this year and a full associate professor next year. And that's what they did. And for the past that they hadn't yet paid me, they still paid me at assistant professor rates. So they diddled me all the way. And then when Bob came and he loved all of us together and we had a marvelous time riding the strip and they put on the Beatles and we played that game, I can like something worse than you can like. Well, by the end of that trip, we were falling in love. And those pictures that you see of me with my hands on my hips and Bob um, looking like Magritte, he's wearing a black suit and he got back to us. I planned those shots. When they say Bob took it, I put Bob on the side and I said, check, here's the camera, press this button. That's the problem about photography. What does it mean? Okay. Did you plan it? Did you think it through? Did you just say, I'll stand here and take it while you... You see, it's a very difficult thing there. But anyway, the, the point was, um, we were loving that relationship and what we were doing. And Bob never took another picture, but was there I was to take them. And um, and I, I went on at UCLA, but um, we were married in my cottage on the street with all the neighbors there, and my parents from Switzerland and all of that. And then um, after that, we both, um, I stayed and packed up. He went to be on a jury at Rice, and we met up again at Rice. I joined him there. And then we all went um, back to, um, to Philadelphia. And I lived in the Bonner and Jury House for six months on the top there. It was like living under a tent. And, um, and, and at the same time, we were both of us too busy. I started working in the office. And, you know, it's not allowed to not pay people for being interns. And um, the AIA says, if you do that, you can't have any awards. Well, I did not ask any pay for the first while because they were doing so badly. But by the end, I was paid. And later I was made a, a, a partner in 1969. But people still think I'm not an architect. It's very funny. They have to write to the RIBA and they will say, we have a, re a record of it and you became an architect in 1956, registered architect. So I became an architect a little bit before Bob. Now, do you want to talk, talk about our projects? Yeah, sure. The book that's been written about me 
And I'm seeing some of the essays, but not all. But it's people who work with me, like, um, or work in the place where I was, and they can go to the records there. And they're just commenting from their own experience on what I did. And like Sylvia Raven, who we have tried to help um, in her career, because she was a daughter of our friend, um, she said, I just didn't realize how you planned a studio like this. But no one's ever done that with her. And um, but what, what I learned from wonderful people with great senses of humor who, who knew all about architecture studios and planning studios, and they knew where the faults lay and really helped me. Um, Britton Harris was a, a marvelous professor. He had a wife who was an architect, and she worked in the planning department at Penn. And, um, he went looking over um, someone's um, shoulder. He said, um, your coined phrase as a counterfeit ring. I thought that was wonderful. And he also um, said there was a good spot. The, the, he, it seemed to say nothing. As the whole argument blazed away, and then at the very end, she'd say, well, now, it seems there are three things. And then he'd find his face to enumerate three things. That set the argument. I just thought it was very brilliant. So it, it, it was fun getting to know people beyond architecture. And my, my place was to say to them, the Athens Charter is wrong. It shouldn't do what it does. It was not done by people who knew how settlement patterns form and why. And it's the place of the movement system in helping to generate them. But it's something that you can learn and learn to love for all the formal possibilities. It can be very, very interesting to learn about it. And don't don't say the Kuduri is nothing. He's very important, but just not in this particular area. And we have the chance to work out a new field that really can work for planners and help them to do the right thing. And that was exciting for me. Um, working in the office, I loved working with Bob. I loved working with some of the other people. Some of them I didn't like. I didn't like the, the, the job captain who said, what's the need doing here? They're getting in the, she's getting in the way. It's Bob, Venturi, and me. We are the heroes here. And, you know, and I can't afford you on my budget. That was not an excuse. I could hit them. But as I got to be 20 years older than most of them, they didn't do that anymore. This was the younger, very ambitious ones. Oh, and there's also a story about um, Frederick Schwartz was giving a lecture. He was one, you know, every year we've had a handy person living with us in this house. And helping us do the things in the summer that, archi that architects don't have time for. Fix this light, mend that thing, new carpets here, fix the stairs there, new bricks, all of that. And he did that for us for a whole year. And we've had about 60 others over the time that we've been here. They come in the summer. And um, so he then came and he worked in the office and he's very good, he's very industrious. And then he worked with me on the plan for Miami Beach. He learned a great deal for me about urban design and urban planning. And then he went to practice on his own and he, he did a lot of airports. He died, he died a couple of years ago. And he also did, um, uh, um, well, mainly for large scale planning that, but he also did furniture, fabrics, and also housing. And um, so I had also the sad job of helping him when he was in huge pain with cancer to um, find ways to uh, help support the pain. And um, they have there's something called the Alexander Technique which is a way of viewing your structure and thinking of it in a way that can help portions of your body share the pain. And the teacher who I used to have come to our office and they're not going to be responsible for 
all these people getting bad backs. So she came to the office, and anyone who had pain in their backs got advice from her, and she now does it with me because I need it too. Well, um, she worked with Fred in imagining similes and metaphors from architecture that will help her back. Think of an elevator going up your, the shaft of your spine all the way, all the way up, relieving the pressure where the pain is and going up beyond it, up and out of the sky. See? And that, I think, is now the way people do try to help people relieve pain when they have those problems. So and the other thing I would do would be um, make the students realize that all those economics, they can really understand it, not the way an economist would, but enough of it to use their judgment on it. And what I've heard was the inventor, more or less, of that whole field. He said to me, um, use your judgment as far as you need and use your um, understanding of what I've taught you about it when you need that. But don't dump your judgment. And I've done many plans where I've produced a desire line diagram which shows where people want to go. And you can measure it by computer. And it's, it's got hugely expensive computer programs that you can work on. But I could take um, a group of people in the studio and line them up against the long wall of the studio and say, you couple here simulate a push cart next to you, and you here think of two people, and this is two people here, and two more on the sidewalk next to you, and here's a bicycle. Now let's measure that. Well, it measures 24 feet. I'm going to take a guess, and that's the width I'm going to make the, the bridge at Michigan across our project there. That was my project mostly, more than anyone else's. And so I, I take guesses like that, and it may be that I have to have several other alternatives so that when that one gets overused, we can use another bridge. That's a possibility too. But I don't have to say um, here's the high level of, of, of guess, here's the low level of guess, Here's the middle, we'll choose the middle. Isn't, isn't it terrible we can't project, um, project the future? That's, you don't have to do that. You say you leave options open for the future. Um, I think now you, you, what you could do is go back. The story of the petition was nice, but it's also sad. You know, it didn't make Bob's life very happy. <laughs> and um, it might make my life very happy when this was, this was going on. And I love the openness. You know, there's, there's lovely feelings in some parts of the school. Um, Harvard is a school that I've taught at a bit. The atmosphere among the students is just wonderful. And they're just warm-hearted. They hug you. And what they'll do is interesting and very personal. The teachers aren't like that. I don't know how that happens, but the students are. And I had so the studio I did there, which was about um, about health and health planning and about hospitals, and uh, but also all the beautiful buildings that bring you health, like churches, for example. The person who came with us to keep us honest about medicine said, "Why are you forgetting churches? They bring down your blood pressure when you walk in there." So. I was getting lots of help of that sort from outside people who said, gee, I wish I'd taken that studio when I was in medical school. So that's it. Great. Yeah, it was really great talking to you. I think you've told us so many stories. It's absolutely amazing. Um, how are you feeling? Do you have anything else that you want to specifically talk about? By the way, um, Anita yes. Norton has done a film of both of us. You know about that. It's called um, Stardust. Uh, okay, yes, I'll look it up. Yes, and you might have to look her up and have her send you a copy because I think it isn't public yet. But it's very beautiful. And it's full of interesting things. As for my book, because I keep on doing things like this, which I think are very important, 
I might not get to finish my book. We'll follow up with some more questions um, and maybe need a second phone call uh, to add more to the story. I think um, this has just been so amazing today and we're, we're really thankful to have you um, speak and, anyone and tell us these stories. It's just was there anyone still left? And if they are, do they have questions? Yeah. Uh, hey, can I ask you a question, Denise? I, I live just off the boardwalk in um, in Venice. Was it ozone you were living on? I'm just guessing here. I'm just guessing. Um, it, what, was it where? Do, I was living in a little cottage. And it was yes. right on the boardwalk. I lived on Hart Street. I think it was number eight Hart Street. I made it a beautiful little cottage inside. My very dear friend when I was there was a certain ethnomusicologist, 35 years or more older than me, called Seeger. And since I was doing how architecture can spring from forces and the forms of architecture can spring from forces, he was talking about how music, not music, music, very much again, how music also sprang from different things in the culture. And when I was faced with a puzzle about how to deal with something like that, he told me how he dealt with it with music. And then when I left, he came and lived in my cottage. Well, thank you, thank you. It's been really lovely speaking with you. All right, you have a great afternoon. It was so nice talking to you. Uh, we really appreciate it. Good, I look forward to what you do. Thank you so bye -bye. much. Thank bye -bye. you, Denise, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you.